Statistics from the 2000 census show that 7 million people identify as being more than one race. It's expected that by the time all the numbers of the 2010 census are in, that figure would have increased by 35 percent. Even with those encouraging numbers, there are critics who point to the fact that the lowest rates of intermarriage are between blacks and whites. They believe that's indicative of the socioeconomic gap that still exists between the two groups. Zyphus LeBron sat down with journalist Clay Kane and Ken Tenabe of Loving Day, an organization that promotes multiracial identity, and talk about the people in America blurring the color lines. Um, before we start the conversation, I want to take in a piece produced by one of our producers about uh, a biracial woman who's talked about her own experience and has started a website to talk about her experiences as a biracial American with the, the rest of the community. So let's take a look. I'm Julianne Rollins. Um, I consider myself biracial, although it's really multiracial, I guess. My mom is a first generation American German Jew, and my dad is black and Catholic with a little bit of pretty much everything else mixed in. I think my parents had been dating for like two years or something like that before my dad felt comfortable introducing my mom to his family and then left her in a diner like some obscene hour of the night um, in the middle of East Elmhurst, Queens, which is not the best area, while he went and told his mother and his sister um, that his girlfriend, who he'd been with for a couple of years, was white and they got to meet her after my mom was waiting for a while. Like They all came back and met her and it ended up being fine. I grew up in a mostly white, reformed Jewish neighborhood. I was in preschool, and the vast majority of the other little kids were white, and preschool is all about learning how to fit in and share and be like the other kids and socialize. Um, so we were doing these self-portraits. Every other child got to use the peach or apricot crayon, except me. So they sat me down and tried to explain to me, well, this is the crayon your dad would use and you know, held up the brown one, and this is the one that your mom would use and held up either the peach or apricot. And what I got from that was that my dad made me have to use a different crayon. Went home, and I remember this very vividly, in the bathroom in front of the sink, crying hysterically. My mom knew what was going on, my dad didn't. So he came in and asked me what was wrong, tried to make me feel better, and I told him I hated him for making me black. And, you know, my parents tried to explain very much all the differences between them in a way that I could understand. And for the most part, they did a good job, both religiously and racially. I guess I still have to say I'm starting, but kind of running an online magazine for multiracial families called Swirl Magazine. Uh, it's for all of them to be able to come to a place and discuss these issues and celebrate the fun parts about it and really create a community uh, that's kind of rallied around helping the individual child find an identity that they're comfortable with, especially in a country like America, where so much of your personality and of who you get to interact with and who you're expected to interact with and your overall identity is centered on race. I had a huge amount of respect and admiration for Obama before he was elected when it came to his outspokenness on his racial identity. And I remember in the beginning of his campaigning, when people would say, oh, you'll be the first black president, he would correct them and say biracial. I was completely shocked when the census finally decided to offer you the option to be able to pick everything that you are and identify as you so chose, that he decided to only mark black. Um, I thought that that was a huge setback for biracial identity and for all the people who have looked up to him as a leader who ignore the he's our first black president and go, no, he's, he's one of us and he's made it and he's gotten through all of these tragic mulatto issues and been able to lead a whole country. It is important to me to possibly be with someone black or biracial. I wasn't opposed to being with someone white and the biggest pointer for that was the fact that um, I, thanks to high school and college, do very firmly religiously identify as Jewish. I'm now with someone who is black and Jewish, although he's fully black, and his family has been black and Jewish for generations, and that's a whole different experience. But I think that there's a lot that he can understand with the split identity factor. When you feel like you're a part of two worlds that are not really compatible, it's okay to combine that, and I definitely, that's the message I'm really trying to get across. Gentlemen, um, 
You know, it's with statistics like the fact that 7 million people during the last uh, census um, identified as ha having a sort of a mixed identity. And uh, there's a lot of talk now with the U.S., the United States, transcending this idea of race. Let's start with you, Clay. Um, uh, what do you think about that? I don't think the U.S. is transcending race. I think that we're more and more confused about race. Um, the truth of the matter is we are all mixed. There is no such thing as being fully black or fully white or black blood and white blood. In the piece that you just showed, the girl said that um, her current boyfriend is fully black. What does fully black mean? You know, the, the, the American experience is a quote unquote mixed experience. And more specifically, the African American experience is an absolutely mixed experience. So I don't think we're transcending. I think we're getting more confused. You know, now we have, we have a diverse people here in America. We have Latinos, we have people of, of Indian descent. I think there's more confusion and creating another racial category, I think is a huge mistake. Yeah, Ken, what do you think? Huh. Well, I agree that um, we're not transcending race. I mean, race to start off with is a social construct. So <clears throat> I hope that we do transcend it one day. But confusion is actually quite a sensitive word in the multi-ethnic community. I think there's a history of thinking that if you're multi-ethnic, you're going to be confused and not have an idea of who you are. Um, so <clears throat> I would sort of choose a different word, perhaps. And as far as making a new ethnic category, um, I'm not sure what else to do at this point. I mean, it, it seems like the next logical step. I'm not saying it's ideal. But I, for one, was glad to be able to check more than one category on the census. And I think there's a growing number of people who identify as multi-ethnic. How that pans out as far as being one monolithic category, or just sort of maybe it'll lead us towards a more uh, rich picture of, of who we are as a, as a country. Right. Now, one of the things that, um, that kind of escapes the conversation sometimes is the whole idea of socioeconomic status when talking about race and identity. I mean, the two of you, for instance, um, have diverse ethnic backgrounds, and certainly your experiences are a little different. What role do you think that socioeconomics play in people identifying, for instance, as black or biracial or so forth? I'll put that to you, Ken. Well, that sounds like it has a lot of history behind it. Um, I can tell you from the perspective of, of the Loving Day Project and the multi-ethnic community that the community is so diverse I don't think that there's really much of a socioeconomic factor when it comes to identifying as multi-ethnic. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, the truth is, is that blacks and Latinos are living below the poverty line. So me, I have a white mother and a black father, but I grew up poor. So I could have said biracial every day, which way I want to say it, but I would still be considered a stat of another African-American child who is living below the poverty line. Of another African-American child who's living in West Philadelphia, regardless of how light or dark I am, uh, living below the poverty line. So I think it's hard to decipher uh, the socioeconomic status of someone who's biracial, you know, depending on your environment, depending on, on where, where, where you're from. Just another point to add, if you want to have this idea of biracial or mixed or multiracial identity, who is included in that? Is someone like Vanessa Williams included? The former um, Black Miss America who has blue eyes, both her parents are black. You know, who isn't included in that? So when you're creating another group, you have to wonder who can or cannot be in that group. Because again, we are all mixed. Nobody is pure anything. Right. So one of the things you wrote, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things you wrote in a recent article that was published that was entitled um, Halle Berry and the Resurgence of the Tragic Mulatto, um, it stirred up a lot of controversy. And one of the things you said in there was that, um, quote, to be mixed allows people to remove themselves from the discriminatory world of blackness. Mm -hmm. I mean... Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what, what, this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, about socioeconomics. Um, so how is this playing out, you feel, in, in American society right now? Well, as a writer, words are really important to me. And the term mixed is very bizarre. You know, you mix a can of paint or a dog. You don't mix a human being. And part of what I was saying in that, in that piece is that I, I, was, I was quoting Paula Patton, who the actress who was in Precious, who is saying the term biracial is offensive because it's kind of like a one up from blackness. And in the history of African-American culture, you saw that with Creoles, who did all they could do in Louisiana, who did all that they could do to remove themselves from being black and say, well, you know, we don't have to abide by Jim Crow laws because we're not really black, we're Creole. And so you see pieces of that today. And what I was also saying is that mixed and biracial were just remixed versions of mulatto, quadroon, and octroon. 
And I, 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 I believe that. Now, I do understand the need for people to embrace all of who they are, embrace, embrace their background, because we all live in some kind of racial duality if you live in America. But I just think it gets very complex when you want to add extra pieces to it. Because I, I would be fascinated to see if there is a new legal racial category, um, again, who will or will not be included in that. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, Ken. Okay. So in response to that, I'd say who's mixed, whoever identifies as mixed, right? And then as far as the complexity of overlaying categories, that's the truth. That's who we are. Um, if you, I mean, I'm not talking about race, the, the social construct, but just sort of in terms of people and how they're distributed in the earth, you get more of a continuum. So complexity is accurate. How it translates into sort of socioeconomic factors is a different story, but it is kind of scientifically what's going on. Mm -hmm. And one more thing I'd add is the idea of both and. Like a lot of scholars, especially in the area of multi-ethnic identity, will tell you that you don't have to choose whether you're one thing or the other. Am I Japanese? Yes. Am I Belgian? Yes. Am I multi-ethnic? Yes. Just like Barack Obama, is he black? Yes. Is he biracial? Also yes. You don't have to cut people into little bits and tell them that you're like a portion this or a portion that, mm -hmm. which harkens back to sort of what you're talking about, the right. quadroon, the octoroon, right. and forcing them into those categories. Absolutely. That's a negative. Mm -hmm. The Absolutely. both and identity is a positive. Um, I agree. Mm -hmm. you, you, you brought up the, the president. Um, as Julian mentioned, she felt a little disappointed that he initially um, talked about the fact that he was biracial. And since then, it's kind of shifted over to him more identifying as the black president. Do you think that he could have been really a, a more of a champion for this idea of promoting this idea of mixed race, biracialism in the United States? I think he's done a lot. Let's put it that way. Look at where people started out. Take someone like Tiger Woods. He was like, I'm Cablin Asian. He had a special term that he used and people were like, okay, since you're black. And he's like, this is my Asian mom. She's sitting right next to me. And she's like, well, since you're black, right? So that's the starting point. You take it to Barack Obama, he says, my mother is from Kansas, my father is from Kenya, I'm a black man living in America. People are like, I get it, right? So he brought us a little bit closer. Um, so I don't disparage him for identifying as black because that's part of who he is. and It doesn't cancel his multi-ethnic identity. Mm -hmm. What about what you think? Well, again, biracial is a pop culture identity. It's not a legal racial identity. I, I you know, give Mariah Carey and Tiger Woods a hats off for championing the biracial identity. Um, I think with President Barack Obama, I don't recall him, maybe he did, but I have to see it. You never know what's really true. I don't recall him ever saying I'm biracial. I recall him using the words multi, multicultural, diverse background. I don't recall him using the words biracial. I think part of it is generational. And you know, I think we all realized Barack Obama is black when during the primary, you're hearing the word nigger being called, be, being used at rallies, when he's, when you know, Sarah Palin and, and uh, you know, John McCain are, are, are having their own rally and there's a picture of him as a monkey on t-shirts. Folks coming to rallies with, 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 with nooses indicating lynchings, he's black. Just like Booker T. Washington was black, he had, a, he had a white parent also. So I don't, as far as a champion, I think what he has been a champion for is us being all Americans. Biracial, black, all that is great. I think we all realize he is a black person in America. And then if he is this biracial thing, then in what way are we gonna chop up his daughters? You know, so it's, it's very complex, but I don't recall him ever using the word biracial. biracial. I could be wrong. Okay. Mm. I, I, just one response to that. <clears throat> the idea of multiracial being a pop culture identity, I beg to differ. I said biracial. Uh, biracial, I okay, biracial. fair enough. But I, I think to a lot of people, when they hear biracial or multiracial, they're sort of, I mean, even the speaker on the, on the, in the piece said that. Um, you know, the Loving Day Celebration in New York brings a thousand people a year together. There's a global network of people who are way out of the spotlight, who are just sort of in their backyards, identifying as multi-ethnic. And that's what resonates with them. But can I just it's add one thing? Their experience. So it's, I just want to say that it's not purely pop culture. There are people outside of the media who genuinely identify with this myself. Oh, sure. Oh, but just one thing. Earlier you said, um, as far as who could be mixed, you said anybody could who, who identifies that. Well, that goes back to my point that we're, we're, we're all mixed. Yeah. So what is it, I mean, if, if, if anybody from George Bush to President Barack Obama to, to you know, John so-and-so living in, in Missouri, well then we are all that, we are all mixed. So I think it kind of, 
it, it doesn't really make sense to me because you just said anybody who wants to. So then, if anybody who wants to, then it's just the the American experience. Well, let's. And hopefully you we'll know, get guys, I, I'm I'm <laughs> so sorry. This is a great conversation, yeah. but we're gonna have to stick a pin and, and leave it here. Um, Clay Kane, Cantanabe, thank you both very much for being here tonight.